On Sunday, July 2nd, 1922, Lake Pepin, a 30-mile bulge of the upper Mississippi in southern Minnesota, lay as peaceful as a painted mill pond. Obviously, Lake Pepin did not expect history to be made on that day, with an event that would influence the lives of uncounted millions around the world. Not that Lake Pepin was afraid of history. It had been at its very vortex for centuries. It was a dividing line for the warring Chippewa and Sioux. Explorers, pioneering priests, fur traders, soldiers, speculators, emigrants, all had found it a convenient, though tortuous, highway into the wilderness. Henry David Thoreau, who came to regain his health, only to die of tuberculosis a year later, praised its beauty. The poet William Cullen Bryant, another visitor, viewed it in fascination. Ex-President Franklin Pierce had come calling. Abraham Lincoln's lanky cousin, Stephen Hanks, had rafted on it. But for years, nothing really historic had occurred on Lake Pepin. Thanks to a tall, young adventurer of Swedish descent, that was about to change. Like Ralph Samuelson's Viking ancestors, the young Swede, one day before his 19th birthday, was about to write a new chapter for the old lake. And he didn't even know he was doing it. On that sleepy Sunday, Lake City, the proud overseer of Lake Pepin, wasn't doing much. It had 13 churches and 13 saloons to match. That morning, the churches welcomed a clear majority of the town's 2,500 residents. Lake City took its religion seriously. The saloons were closed on the Lord's Day, as were all the stores and its three gas stations. On the veranda of the Hotel Lion, a few blocks from the lake, a few cronies were exchanging gossip, their armchairs tilted against the gray board wall. Hard times is coming, said one voicing a well-founded fear heard in hamlets and big cities alike. One likely harbinger would be a hike in the price of a glass of beer. As if the nickel isn't too much already, said one. Those in town whose preference had been hard liquor were grumbling about Prohibition's introduction six months earlier. Minnesota papers were reporting that in Duluth, three black circus workers had been lynched by a mob hours after a 19-year-old white woman claimed she had been raped. In the wider world, Warren Harding, just two weeks before, had become the first president to be heard on radio. Babe Ruth was signed to a three-year, $52,000 contract with the Yankees. And Adolf Hitler, on his way to dictatorial power, was blaming Germany's economic woes on the Jews, a warning sign of the Holocaust to come. The curious and the bored began drifting down to the beach that afternoon. The women were in full bloomered bathing suits that exposed no tempting sinful flesh. The men were in knee-length breeches, knee socks, and shirts with long sleeves. The grown-ups were largely unaware that the lake, on that day and hour, was a laboratory for an invention. But the younger set was aware that Ralph Samuelson was up to something. He had long ago mastered the aquaplane and could make that one board perform in magical ways. Now he had told his friends that if you could ski on snow with two skis, you ought to be able to do it on water as well. Prominent among the young fry skimming stones over the water as they waited was 10-year-old Ben Simons. He was already handsome with a sharp, intelligent face, inquisitive brown eyes, commanding brown hair. His older companion, Lou Macklin, was predicting disaster. He'll drown himself. That crazy Sammy will drown himself. Ben had been a witness to some of Sammy's early experiments that might well have drowned a more fearful and less determined mortal. There was a large measure of hero worship in Ben's rebuttal. You couldn't drown him. He'll do it. Wait and see, he'll do it. 
Some 100 yards offshore, where the water was about 10 feet deep, a bedraggled old launch was getting a Sunday reprieve from its weekday's assignment of hauling a barge reeking of clam. By looks alone, it was an unlikely candidate for a place in history. At top speed, it could barely muster 14 knots. Lou Macklin's credibility was gaining stature as Ralph found himself unable to rise above the surface, swallowing water on more than one attempt. From a greater distance, where the water was at least 20 feet deep, the launch's old Saxon motor was pouring forth a steadier staccato cough as it slowly gained speed. Ben Simon's eyes widened and a smile began to form. Look, Lou, he's doing it. Sammy is skiing on water, like a duck taken off. Hooray, he done it like he always said he would. But Lake City didn't seem to know or care what had happened. The bells of St. Mary's, St. Mark's, and St. John's didn't ring. The fire whistle atop the old Georgian-style red brick city hall didn't howl. The newly organized Louis McHale Post 110 of the American Legion didn't organize a parade. Ten-year-old Ben Simon seemed to be the only celebrant. But the truth remained. On that sleepy afternoon, July 2nd, 1922, at the rather ordinary hour of 4.11 p.m., teenager Ralph Stammerson became the first human being to ski on water. Official recognition was 44 years away. After his first successful attempt at water skiing, Ralph Samuelson spent every spare minute modifying the skis and perfecting new daredevil stunts. Word of his exploits on water began to spread, and the sports editor of the St. Paul Daily News persuaded him to take his skis 60 miles to the north, where he performed on White Bear Lake. The stony spectators erupted in applause and the Daily News and the more widely read St. Paul Pioneer Press recorded the event in headlines and splicey photos. After that brief but significant brush with publicity, Ralph became even more daring in his performances, so much so that neighbors began to call him a show-off and a ham. In this small town of 3,000, where everybody knew something about everybody else's business, Ralph was no longer just a crackpot and a little off upstairs, but that young Samuelson squirt who thinks he's somebody special. But that simmering judgment did not dissuade the more practical-minded to follow what might be a stream of money. Eventually, Ralph became the star performer at regularly weekly water carnivals. City fathers built a small bandstand by the shore facing the cove where Ralph was performing an area now known as Ahuda Park. Audiences, including out-of-towners, gathered, watched the spectacle, ate picnic lunches, patronized Zump Adolph's popcorn wagon, and were entertained with Sousa marches and popular songs. The small entrance fees collected at the Stofence Gate were stashed away and later applied to the purchase of land for the city's marina. What is now part of almost every skier's routine is the jump acquired by speeding up and onto an inclined ramp and being vaulted into the air. Ralph had no template for the feat other than his own intuition. He repurposed a diving platform by submerging it about a foot on one end to create a 30 degree incline. The contraption, as he later recalled, was about four feet wide and 16 feet long. He convinced his skeptical brother Ben to steer the boat close enough so he could swing out and get the skis on the planks. After hours of trial and error, as Ralph dared himself to swing closer and closer to the raft, he got his skis on the submerged end of the dock and was pulled upward to the very top and became stuck there. He tumbled off head first without his skis. He found a solution to his problem a few blocks away at a corner grocery 
where he bought or borrowed several pounds of lard that had gone rancid. After slathering it across the platform, he had Brother Ben fire up the engine once again. In 1925, three years and six days after he'd been the first human to ski on water, Ralph W. Samuelson became the first to do a water ski jump. There were even more dramatic happenings in the months that followed. He became the first speed skier, first behind a boat equipped with a weird discarded airplane motor, then reaching 80 miles per hour behind a World War I Curtis flying boat. 1926 arrived. Ralph Samuelson was now 23. He knew he was the father of water skiing, but outside of a small circle of admirers in his hometown, the fact went unacknowledged. He decided his future lay elsewhere, and he headed to Detroit, where he joined a cousin as a worker on Henry Ford's assembly line. The wages were handsome by any standard, but as winter receded and spring approached, Ralph kept looking at the skis he had brought with him and began exploring the area for a place to use them. Located almost under the famous Detroit Bell Island Bridge, he found a small concern that rented out fancy, mahogany hulled speedboats capable of 35 miles an hour. The patrons were joyriders, society women showing country friends a good time, honeymooners, and tourists. But to Ralph, these boats meant only one thing, vehicles to pull him over water on his much-neglected skis. The leasing company, amazed at his initial demonstration, saw a publicity opportunity in Ralph's unique skill and signed him up. Ralph, a teetotaler himself, soon became a trusted captain for parts Prohibition-era Americans whom he transported to and from the watering holes of Windsor, Canada. He also was a frequent witness while fast boats from Windsor landed right next to the boat livery, unloaded as many as 50 cases of fine liquor, transferred the lot to a truck, which then dashed into town under police escort. When the season ended on Labor Day, Ralph was without a job. He felt that Florida was beckoning. He knew the way, having driven there once before from Lake City, and his friend Chester Stewart a short friend who sought height parity with elevator shoes had a Model T Roadster. So off they went, top down, with Ralph's eight-foot-long skis strapped to one fender and jutting out fore and aft. Ralph had made his earlier trip the year before, in 1925, at the request of his father, Charles, who was hoping, along with thousands of other gambling speculators, to cash in on the boom in Florida land. Charles wanted to visit what he had purchased sight unseen, 10 acres, three miles from the Gulf Coast, and one lot in a town to be called Lantana. Father and son set out on wintry roads the day after Christmas and Ralph's six-cylinder Essex. It was a harrowing 10-day journey of 2,200 miles. The detour around Chicago was grueling. Unplowed snow, packed tight by trucks and cars, was two feet thick in places, and it was like driving on a gigantic washboard. In Indiana, a repairman gouged them $50 to replace a wheel bearing, making a dismal dent in their scant financial reserve. They wandered off course in Tennessee and had to explain their presence to skeptical moonshiners. Some individuals they encountered en route looked upon the road as a private source of income and collected by means of toll gates or chained bridges. Florida, on that first trip, represented uncertainty. Now it would bring good fortune, followed by a life-changing personal disaster. Before those details present themselves, it's instructive to learn more about Ralph himself. It might be tempting to guess, given the luxury of an Essex and the many leisure hours he devoted to the invention of water skiing, that his boyhood was one of privilege and easy choices. But that was not the case. After school was out for the summer at Washington Elementary, Ralph, only seven that first summer, picked weeds at the Jewel Nursery and put his meager earnings towards the family's groceries. 
He was only 10 when he was hired on Fred Rose's clamming boat, where his already apparent hand and eye coordination enabled him to grab clams off metal hooks one after the other until more than 400 clams lay at the bottom of the old barge around his bare feet. Zach Nyhart, whose family name is still in the local phone book, hired the 11-year-old Ralph to help with his net fishing operation. They developed a ritual in which each would predict how many barrels of fish they would bring home each day. Sammy, the nickname applied to him by Nyhart, would collect the prize, banana split, with uncanny frequency. He once sat down to four them at their weekly settling up rendezvous at Jane's Sweet Shop on South Washington. Ralph's father Charles had to give up his Center Street grocery, probably because of a drinking problem. He used money from the bankruptcy to salvage a nice launch powerful enough to pull a clamming barge. Recollecting that time years later, Ralph said, Fred Rose, the man I had worked for, helped my dad get started, showing him how to make hooks, where to dredge, and what to do with the clams. My brothers and I became a big help to our father. Times were hard. Ralph's mother, Mary, had taken up weaving to help keep the household afloat and was soon bringing in more income than the clamming business. Ralph's younger brother, Charlie, died in a gun accident with Ralph and his father looking on. Charlie was eight. Ben, 19, went off to World War I where he saw action in France. Ralph's schooling ended with eighth grade, not uncommon for boys of his era. In the summer of 1926, Ralph returned to Detroit. In late winter, a devastating hurricane struck Florida. Ralph drove back and discovered that their Palm Springs boat livery had been destroyed. He and his group had no choice but to start all over. I pondered two things from the hurricane, Ralph said. First I asked, why did the compassionate God do this to mankind? Secondly, I learned that human beings have fantastic rebounding capacities. The rebuilt boat livery became a big success. It featured two racing vessels designed and built by Gar Wood, himself a Minnesota native. They were fast with top speeds of 50 miles an hour and elegant with their mahogany hulls. The boats were always in demand by rich playboys, wealthy widows, and even foreign royalty. Most of Ralph's skiing was done during the intermissions of national and international boat races. During one show, Ralph lost the ski but continued on without missing a beat, thus becoming the inventor of skiing on one foot. While working at the Palm Spring Boat Livery in late 1927, an 800-pound boat platform landed on Ralph. While lying in bed in Lantana with an injured back, other troubles were piling up. Inferior oil had somehow been introduced into engines of the Gar Woods, rendering both vessels inoperable. Ralph considered his options. I decided to go home, he concluded. Back in Lake City, he joined his brother, Donald, in a rented shack along Lake Pepin in the lower part of town and went back into the clamming business. During a severe storm one night, early in the summer of 1928, Ralph, on his own initiative, saved a couple of sailboats from being dashed and demolished on shoreline rocks. Ralph's act of bravery and selflessness caught the attention of C.K. Berkey, a millionaire whose estate was on the lake about two miles from the downtown. He hired Ralph as caretaker of the property, known as Pepin Lodge. Ralph quickly demonstrated that he was a jack of all trades, piloting boats, repairing cars, fixing the swimming pool, painting flagpoles, all with great efficiency. While out for a good time one evening at the Oak Center Dance Hall, 10 miles into the countryside from Lake City, he was instantly smitten by Marilyn O'Casey, a strikingly beautiful farmer's daughter. They married on July 4th, 1932. 
Marilyn's parents owned farms near Oak Center and Zumbro Falls. Ralph quit his Berkey estate job and embarked on farming, for which he had no previous exposure. He and Marilyn struggled to make a decent living at farming and veered off into raising turkeys. Ralph was a quick study. Together they established a thriving business, not only shipping full-grown turkeys to market, but selling chicks as well, sometimes as many as 3,000 a week. He had begun on a shoestring, and it had become a bonanza. The poor boy, who had been happy when he had an extra nickel in his pocket, now had a Lincoln Continental, motorboats, an airplane, and buildings worth hundreds of thousands. Trade publications ran his picture and pronounced him an innovative expert in raising turkeys. He enjoyed a measure of fame well beyond his immediate world of rural Minnesota. But he also felt something was missing. I realized suddenly that it wasn't really success that I craved. I wanted something more. I was always searching for some way to satisfy that strong inner hunger gnawing at my soul. I kept on searching, crying inside, longing for an answer, a sign, any sign. A sign presented itself, but it was an ugly, painful discovery that sent him into a spiral of despondency and nearly ended his career. He and Marilyn were attending a poultry raisers convention in Mason City, Iowa. Also attending was the well-heeled executive of a farm equipment company. This man in Maryland had an affair going and now Ralph knew of it. After 15 years of marriage, Ralph's divorce from Maryland became final on December 9, 1947. Despondent and confused, he sought the counsel of a local pastor. He was consumed by a need for spiritual meaning and he prayed for God's guidance. Thus he felt it was divine intervention when he found himself sitting near Hazel Thorpe in the Pine Island Methodist Church on Christmas Day, 1947. It was a whirlwind courtship for the turkey farmer and the school teacher. To avoid the six month waiting period after a Minnesota divorce, they went across the border to a Methodist church in Decorah, Iowa, and were married on April 10, 1948. After a brief honeymoon, it was back to the turkey farm. Ralph was a good and patient teacher Hazel quickly became integral to the enterprise. The two made a good team, even branding their own pedigreed stock. They loaded chicks into a station wagon equipped with special heaters and fans that kept the chicks warm during trips to farms sometimes several hundred miles away. Meanwhile, Lake City had been touched by the years. One by one, old buildings lining the harbor were coming down. The button factory, the old power plant, the junkyard, and the Botsford Lumber Yard. The entrance to the Lake City Harbor was switched from the north to the south end. When Ben Simons, the harbor master, was helping to plan the 1948 Lake City Water Carnival, scheduled for the 4th of July, he thought of Ralph Samuelson and his history-making skis. After hearing that Ralph was raising turkeys near Mazeppa, a half hour's drive from Lake City, Simons searched him out. They found the skis in a barn up in the highest rafters, covered with layers of dust, pigeon droppings, and mouse kernels. There were even some old photographs of Ralph water skiing. Back in Lake City, Ben put the skis and photographs on display in the window of Collins Drugstore. After the carnival, the skis were stored in the attic of a local store. Calamity once again visited the turkey operation. Thousands of turkeys were decimated by cholera in the summer of 1950, and then the replacement turkeys were lost to yet another deadly disease in the fall of 1951. The Samuels declared bankruptcy in 1952. Despite the unrelenting hardship, Ralph remained an incurable optimist. When you come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on, he would say. He found his prayers answered once again when another farmer hired Ralph to provide land and help with huge flocks of young turkeys. In 1953, 
Ben Simons had retrieved Ralph's old water skis from storage and attached them to the south wall of a new bathhouse located near the Lake City Beach. He added some photos, a vintage newspaper article, and a sign that read, World's First Water Skis. They attracted little attention. Ralph didn't even know they were there. He was too busy dealing with another turkey problem. Ralph found a partner and they bought a turkey farm located at the old Lake City Airport near Frontenac. The situation soon went south. The partner died of a heart attack. The partner's cousin inadvertently brought in diseased hatching eggs, wiping out all the birds in both Frontenac and Mazeppa. It was 1957. Ralph Samerson was broke again at 54. Hazel got a job teaching at the Pine Island Elementary School and Ralph resorted to working part-time with the Minnesota Highway Department. The saga of sadness led to a pivotal point in 1963. Ralph was later to use racing metaphors to capture the euphoria. His life had taken a turn into the stretch, the straightaway, approaching what he called the golden wire the grand climax, planned by God ever since I was born. His early fame was being rediscovered. Margaret Crimmins, unknown to Samuelson, was the agent. She was the woman's page editor on the St. Paul Pioneer Press, and she became intrigued at seeing the skis on the wall of the Lake City bathhouse while she was at the beach in late July 1963. Margaret, an excellent skier herself, wrote a long article. Ralph read her piece and thought, it was like a voice out of my past. Here I was in Little Pine Island, somewhat of a has-been after my big undertaking as a turkey farmer, occasionally leafing through my memory book, remembering many things. That first day of success on Lake Pepin, the jump, the speed, now this. Frankly, when I read that article, it hit me right across my eyes, hard. I had completely forgotten that Ben Simons had taken those skis. He soon met with Margaret Crimmins to provide her with additional information and photographs. Not much happened until September 19, 1965, when a second article addressed the question of who held legitimate bragging rights about the invention of water skiing. The headline summed it up. Lake City disputes French Riviera paternal claim to water skiing. On December 9, 1965, the Lake City Chamber of Commerce sent a letter to the American Water Ski Association attesting to the fact that Ralph Samuelson, quote, was water skiing on Lake Pepin in 1922 and many years after that. The association's reply six weeks later acknowledged, quote, Mr. Ralph W. Samuelson as the first water skier of record known to our association. Never before had the town been challenged so openly to take its light out from under the bushel and let it shine. A grand birthplace of water skiing acknowledgement program was planned for June 19, 1966. Press kits were dispatched to every newspaper in the area and the response by the public was overwhelming. The ski club from Pyre Lake performed to a crowd estimated to be from 8,000 to 10,000. In 1972, the 50th anniversary of water skiing and the city's centennial, Lake City held a combined commemoration of both events. Just prior to the featured parade on July 2nd, Ralph was driven to the government pier where dignitaries unveiled a bronze plaque attached to a stone cairn affirming Lake City as the birthplace of water skiing. Ralph Samuelson led the parade, looking natty with his Commodore uniform and skipper's cap. Lake City's modest population of 3,600 was swelled by more than 34,000 visitors from outside the community. The judging stand rated the merits of 168 parade units over a four-hour period. After the event, Ralph summed up his feelings. After going through the humbling process so many years, I certainly did not get a swelled head, but this I admit with delight. 
I did have an inner joy from the realization that an ordinary person like myself could receive such recognition through the whole world. It seemed to me that cloudy afternoon, while the lake lay quiet and peaceful, almost as it had that day 44 years ago, as if she was smiling at me, or rather winking. It was as if we understood each other. She was telling me, well, old boy, did you ever think it would come to this? Oh, never mind thanking me. It was you who conquered me. You weren't afraid of me as so many others were, and together we did it, you and me. On August 19, 1972, at a Seattle banquet, Ralph was awarded a place in the Water Ski Hall of Fame by the American Water Ski Association. He was the guest of honor when the Water Ski Hall of Fame Museum was officially dedicated in 1977. The Wave, a large bronze sculpture honoring Ralph, was unveiled in Ahuda Park with him present on September 15, 1976, near where he had first risen from the waters of Lake Pepin. Engraved upon it are these words. If we had a way of foreordaining these things, organized water skiing couldn't have picked a finer father than Ralph Samuelson. He has been a real asset in promoting the sport since his discovery, largely because of his modesty and genuine wonderment at what he started quite innocently back in 1922. Ralph W. Samuelson died in 1977 and was buried in Oakwood Cemetery. His grave marker reads, Ralph Samuelson, father of water skiing, witness of Christ. Left of a journey.